you know, David in this psalm, he was saying how he was frustrated with the situation he was in. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good, but my anguish increased. One of the problems with everything that's happening is anguish is increasing in people, anxiety, stress, worry. And one of the hardest things is trying to plan your lives, yeah? Very difficult to plan your lives when every week the rules of the nation change. I mean, last night they changed again about what we can and cannot do. And we understand the government's got a difficult job, but uh, it's very hard for us to plan when we know at any minute the laws of what we can and cannot do and how we can and cannot go about our lives keep changing. My heart grew hot within me while I meditated. That word's going to be important this morning, that, that, that Hebrew word. The fire burned, then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. David's saying, well, I've got to know how long I've got to plan stuff. If I'm going to live 50 years, I've got to know. I've got if I'm going to live another month, I need to know that. I can't plan things. And one of the hard things we've got, and it's, it's perhaps harder for a church to plan stuff than anyone else, when we don't know what we can and cannot even do from one week to the next. Let's go down. You have made my days a mere hand's breadth. The span of, my, span of my years is of nothing before you. Everything is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom in vain. They rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. Just read one more verse. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Yeah? But now, what are we looking for? With all this craziness all over the world, and who knows what's going to happen next? You know, we're hoping things are going to get back to normal, but they might not for a very long time. They might even get worse. We don't know. But now, what do we look for? And now, what do we put our hope in. David says, I put my hope in the Lord. And one of the positive things about, if there is a positive thing about this whole pandemic, is that people are being pushed to a position of deciding what their hope really is in. Because the things that you thought you could put your hope in, you can't. You can't put your hope in the things in society or even the government's ability to deal with things because there's things so big the government can't deal with them. What is our hope in? Well, our hope as Christians should be in the Lord. It should have always been in the Lord anyway because the Lord has clearly told us that all the other things you can't hope in, they might go just like that. But the one thing we do hope in, the one thing that we do put our trust in, is that our hope is in God. And as we've come this morning, and we've still got our restrictions and a shortened meeting, but our hope is in God. We can't have praise as we would normally have it, but our hope is in God. Can't even preach how we would normally like to preach, but our hope is in God. God's Word still points us to Him. We're going to listen to some songs. We're going to worship the Lord, even though we can't sing. But we're going to put our hope in God because God is here with us. And so we're going to put our hope in God. So whatever problems you're facing, and we're all facing many issues at the moment with our lives and businesses and families and education, everything's sort of on hold and the, uh, the finances and the economics and all this stuff is affecting everybody. But it's not affecting our hope in God, or it shouldn't be, because none of these things can take us away from His presence. And so although we have to be still this morning and we can't be as active as we normally would, God's presence is still here. And so we're going to put our hope in Him. Let's stand in the presence of the Lord. We're going to listen to some songs and we're going to just look, at, look to the Lord, put our hope in Him, put our trust in Him. So as we listen to these songs, close our eyes and just worship the Lord, even though we're doing it quietly. God's presence is still with us. Even though we have to be still, we can still worship the Lord. So let's put our hope in the Lord, for he is here. And let's worship him as we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Let's have the music, please.
lay down everything else. got enough things to think about every day of the week every hour all the worries and problems for this hour we come to Jesus those who are thirsty you come to Jesus those who are weak you come to Jesus and we receive our rest from him we receive our refreshing from him Jesus says come all you are thirsty Come to me and drink. He will give you the water, the river of life that will flow into you and out of you and will become a river of living water flowing without of you, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with us. He's here because we've met in the name of Jesus. He's not here because you can feel him. He's not here because you can see him. He's here because he says he's here. He's promised to be here. And although we feel muzzled and restricted, he isn't. You can't stop God. In the Bible, they put God's people in prison. It didn't stop God. You can't stop the church. receive the life of Jesus this morning as you focus on him. Jesus says even when you look to him just looking to him in faith you receive life because he shines upon you. Father thank you once again that we can gather. Thank you for these restrictions Lord that shows us once again how precious our faith is in you the thing that can never be taken because our hope is in you. Our hope is in who you are. And so, Lord, thank you once again that together we can meet and worship our God. We can listen to his word, your word, Lord, and we can receive refreshing from you. Lord, let your blessing rest upon all your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just wave to someone. Got some people here not being for a few weeks because of vulnerability issues. Just wave to them. Wave slowly. Wave like the queen. So you're not wafting your germs. You don't, you don't move your wrists. You just do that. There we go. We can still have joy. Go on, sit down. I know it's terrible not being able to sing for a lot of us. Some of us are loving it. We know that. Hallelujah. Well, as you can see, we've started an archaeological dig site here. <laughs> this is one of the original baptismal pools used in the time of Moses. <laughs> we took the opportunity while we were closed to try and lower the stage. And uh, as always, it's a lot more complicated than it appears. Um, but hopefully that will be done by the end of the month. Hallelujah. Well, we just read a psalm there. Um, that, that said a word, and I, I want us to look at this word this morning. In the psalm, when David says he was muzzled, he said, uh, while I meditated on your word, while I, uh, I wasn't speaking, he said, I, I muzzled my mouth, but inside I was saying something. And this word that's translated meditated in the Hebrew, uh, hagiad, Actually, there's a prophet called Haggai. It's, it's the same, same word, same root word. Uh, it's something Jesus did quite a lot. But when you're reading it in the English, you might miss it. In fact, some, some, some versions of the Bible don't even translate it. You know, sometimes there's something in one language that it's very difficult to translate into another language. Yeah? Does anyone know what the English is for ulala? I don't know. We use words all the time, like hallelujah, don't we? And we, we don't think that doesn't, that's not even a word. We, we don't bother translating it. We just assume everyone knows what the word means. Now, this word that we, we've just read there in that psalm, um, 
Sometimes uh, it's not translated meditate. It's basically uh, something you're doing inwardly. Now, let's, can, we, can we put up these scriptures? Mark chapter 7 and verse 32. Um, I was reading the Gospel of Mark this week, and I, I actually read three chapters. Mark chapter, uh, one, one morning I was reading this. Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 8, and Mark chapter 9. And I noticed that in each of these chapters, Jesus, Jesus does something that you might miss because it's not a word he uses, but it's something that they all saw him do and observed, and it's actually um, just as important or, or perhaps even more important than saying something. Let's see, if you can under, let's see if you get it in this first one. I'm sure you will. There were some people who brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. They begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Ephaphtha, which means be open. Right, let's just stop there. Jesus looked up to heaven, and he doesn't say anything. But the guys who are writing the gospel, this is Mark, notices something that's so important that Jesus does, he writes it down. It says Jesus has a deep sigh. Why? What does that even mean? Has anyone got any teenagers? You've got teenagers. You've had teenagers. Have you ever noticed sometimes you ask them to do something? You know, clean the kitchen or the bedroom or just, just, just do anything, like pass me that cup of tea, anything. It can be anything. And they don't say anything. Yeah? But they do something that is worse than saying something. They do something like this. And then, when you address the issue and say something like, what was that? The response is, I didn't say anything. Which is true. They didn't say anything. But what they did, they did actually say something. They, did, they just didn't let it out, did they? Oh, they said something. Their attitude, their disposition, this deep sigh actually spoke more than anything they could have said. And that affected you as a parent more than if they'd just gone, Ooh, go on then. That, that deep grunt sometimes was so emphatic it actually uh, transmitted so much information, it meant far more than a word. What is it Jesus did that made them write it down? It weren't just a sigh. They wrote, it's, it's, it's actually a, a very clear word. You know, it's a, it's, it's a description. It, Jesus was probably speaking Aramaic. He was, because it says there, Ephaphtha, after it, which is Aramaic, for be opened. So he would have been using this word that we looked at earlier. It's that word to inwardly say something, but not let it out. Do you know we all do that all the time? Sometimes our inward words are more than our outward words. We don't say anything. Jesus was doing, remember, everything Jesus does is a message from God. It's not just what he says. It's not, not just where he goes, what he does, what he touches, how he acts. Jesus has a deep sigh, and it's so important. And you'll notice Mark records it each, in each one of these chapters that we're going to look at. But what is God saying? Why is Jesus sighing? Let's just read down the, the rest of the verse. At this, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plain. Notice this man couldn't speak. Perhaps that's one of the reasons Jesus wasn't speaking. I don't know. 
Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. If you read the context of what's happening here, Jesus is doing a miracle. He's opening, he's opening the, the mouth and the ears of a man who can't... Li- I mean, it's, it's an amazing miracle. According to Jewish tradition, someone who was born deaf and dumb, if they were healed, because it never happened in the Old Testament, this miracle, it was proof that that person would be the Messiah. Only the Messiah, only the, you know, God's anointed one would be able to do this miracle. So Jesus was here proving to all the Jewish people that he was the Christ, that he was the anointed one. And all the Jewish rabbis knew this because of the miracle he did. But you read the context that even when he did that, they still didn't believe in him. And Jesus is saying, don't go tell anyone because they're not going to listen. And I think that's really why Jesus is giving this inward sigh. Jesus is, is, is realizing, look, I'm, I'm doing a miracle for this guy. But the crowds are still not listening. You know, sometimes in all of our lives, but certainly for Jesus, you find the more he did, the less people listened. If you've read the Gospels, you'll notice that. To to such an extent that sometimes he'd literally stand up in a synagogue and say, right, um, does God heal on the Sabbath? And he'd get, a, he'd get a man out and he'd heal him in front of everyone. And when everyone saw the miracle, it says they then decided to kill Jesus. And you read it and you think, what? He's just healed a person. And so because Jesus has done a miracle, they now think, well, let's kill him for being good. And this is what's happening in the life of Jesus at this point in his ministry. And so what does Jesus do? He does what we would do. He just looks up to heaven and goes, Jesus knows he can heal people. Jesus knows he can touch you this morning. But he also knows that most people aren't listening. And that creates within him this, this thing that is translated a deep sigh. I wonder if what we're doing in life is causing God to have a deep sigh. You know, this, this lockdown, I've had a lot of deep sighs. You know, sometimes it's like, whatever happens, I've had a deep sigh this morning when the guys just told me the, the stuff weren't working now, they've worked out and they put it, this has all been typed in manually because we've, we've lost the license. You know, and sometimes I just think, Gah. you know, people say, what's up? And I'm like, <sighs> that's what's up. Have you got a deep sigh this morning? Just tell me what's wrong. Here's what's wrong. <sighs> I can't put it into words. I just... <sighs> Everyone just let it out. But not, not, not loud, not deep. You want to be breathing in people. Do it into your elbow. <sighs> you know, on Friday when the government says from next week we have to wear masks, you know, people phoned me up, some pastors, and they went, <sighs> <sighs> I just, I just, you know, we, we, we've got an expression in Barnsley, haven't we? I can't speak. <laughs> and literally, that's what we mean. I just, And we, but we don't think of God doing that, do we? We don't think of God. Here's Jesus just going, oh, you know, whatever, oh, for goodness sake, oh, what's the point? Oh, honestly. But he did. He would sometimes turn up. And, is God sighing this morning? Is God, I mean, we're all sighing, but is God, is God going, oh, honestly, I'm here. I'm healing people. And the crowds are going, oh, well, we're not quite sure about you. We're not quite sure if Jesus is, you know, what if he... Jesus is going, honestly, what do you want me to do? Oh, hagia. It can be sometimes translated meditate, because that's what you're doing, aren't you? You're like, you're not speaking, but you, you, 
you're sort of releasing something, but you're not putting it into words. It can sometimes be translated groan or, or even grumble. But it, he, it's, it's to deeply sigh. And for them to record it, it must have been an outward, you know, it weren't just like, it was like, hmm, what's up with him? You know, it was, it was observable to everybody there. God was sighing. But he still touched the guy. You see, when we sigh, it's usually a sign that we've had enough and we're not going to do anymore, isn't it? Nope. <sighs> Wash my hands of it. Jesus sighed, but then still touched him. Even though he knew the crowds were going to turn against him, the more that he did. God is always God, even when he's sighing. Let's go to the next chapter then. That's Mark chapter 7. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse 11. Mark chapter 8 and verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. Now remember, Jesus has just, Jesus has just done loads of miracles. We've just seen one in the previous chapter. Jesus just has been going to synagogue to synagogue. He's been feeding the multitudes. He's been doing all this stuff. And they come to him and say, we want a sign. A sign from heaven. He, there it is again, he sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. But it, it's not what Jesus says there. It's, I, would have, I hopefully would have picked up there at the beginning of verse 12, where he sighs deeply. To me, that would have been more. You know when you go and ask somebody a question? I do this all the time. Apparently, I do this all the time. So I've been told by reliable people who are married to me. <laughs> you know, someone comes and asks you a question, and the answer, before you even give an answer, you go, oh. <sighs> Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, what a question. You know, you would pick up at that point, I've asked a daft question. <laughs> or what I've said is don't make sense, or, or et cetera, et cetera. And if I do that, well, Jesus did it so I can. But the point is, Jesus is doing all this stuff. And instead of looking at what God's doing, they're questioning about something else they want done. That causes God to sigh. You know, this happens all the time in our lives. It certainly happens in church all the time. Instead of looking at what God's doing, people are questioning God about what they think he should be doing. Right, you'll see this on the... Whenever there's a problem in the world, what's the question? They, they bring on some spiritual person and they say, why isn't God sorting this out? They don't look at what God is doing. They don't look at what God has done. They don't look at everything God has said and what he's done and in the Bible. They just say, we want God to do this. And if God's not going to do... You see, the Pharisees came, they began to question Jesus. They weren't, they weren't interested in knowing Jesus. They weren't interested in seeing what Jesus had done and what Jesus had said. They were only interested in saying, right, we want God to do this. We want this, we want this sign. We want God to do this. If God doesn't answer this, then we're not going to believe in you. Jesus just gave his sigh. He says, no, you, you, no. No, you've, you've missed it. He was there doing all the miracles. And they weren't listening. Jesus, they're asking for a sign. Jesus is the sign. Imagine turning up to God and saying, I want proof God exists. It's like, he's there. Can't you see what he's doing? He's just healed that guy. He's just spoke that. He's just said that. He's just fed the multitude. Can't you see that? No, I, I, want, I want God to do this. Well, God's not here to do what you want. He's here to save you. If you don't know that, you're not going to get a sign. The greatest sign you'll ever get is Jesus. The greatest sign of God is Jesus. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. I want proof God exists. He's there. 
It's Jesus. You don't get any better proof than that. You can't have any better proof than that. God cannot prove himself to you more than becoming a person and talking to you. That is the greatest proof you can ever have. Just think about it logically. Have you ever spoke to an ant? Has any of you ever talked to an ant or a green fly or, you know? You haven't. Do you know why? They can't hear you. They don't know you're real. Do you know you could, you could squash that ant with your thumb? The ant still doesn't know you exist. It just knows he's dead. It knows something bad's happening, but it doesn't know. The only way you could talk, do you know the only, you know, you could read to an ant the story of history of ants. The ant still wouldn't know. The only way you could talk to an ant is to become an ant. Rub its antennas and share the pheromones and the ant would suddenly start to go, ooh, an ant. Now imagine you now saying to that ant, actually, I'm not an ant. I'm a supreme being a million times greater than your intellect. Do you know what the ant would think? No, you're just an ant like me. It's very hard for God to communicate to us because we don't believe who and what he is. The greatest sign God sent is Jesus. No miracle is a greater sign than that because you can absorb, observe that and just see it as a phenomenon and think, oh, that just happened, that's just a strange coincidence or that's just a, a freak of nature. You'd always misinterpret it, but you can't misinterpret who Jesus is. It's, it's as clear as day. He said who he was. And so he got to the point where he just sighed. You've seen enough. If you're not going to believe that, what's God doing now in the midst of all this trouble? He's being God. He is who he says he is. If we don't get that, look at the next chapter, chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 and verse 16. So again, you'll notice Mark's noticing this in each chapter, so it's pretty important or you wouldn't write it down. Now, here's, here's something you might miss if you read it just in English. So what are you arguing about, he asked them. Jesus is just, actually, he's just, been transfigured he's just shown he's God you know and, and God from heaven has spoken and the clouds come down so he just demonstrated to those people that were there he's God and 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 now now the next day he's in the middle of an argument bit of a church argument you ever been in the middle of a church argument you know God's just showed he's God but in the church is arguing about stuff and they're arguing about why someone's not healed you ever heard those arguments in church how come God hasn't done this? The minute you start arguing about what God hasn't done, you've already missed it. You have to look at what God is doing, and as you look at that, you'll soon find what, what else God wants to do. But God won't do something when you're arguing about what he hasn't done. You'll find he just looks at you and ignores you. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He's possessed by a, a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Let me just stop there because now we haven't got the technology to switch between translations here. It's not translated in that language, in in that version of the Bible. If you read the King James, he doesn't say, you unbelieving generation. He says something else. He says, oh, you unbelieving generation. And, and it is there. It's just, they don't know how to translate. I mean, how do you translate that? If you were writing down what I said today and I went, oh, what would you write? Hmm. What does hmm mean? You wouldn't know what to write. And so Jesus has just shown he's God. He's just transfigured himself. He's proved he's God. God the Father spoke and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, my only beloved son. So like Jesus is like, surely they've got it now. God has spoke from heaven, the clouds appeared, Jesus has proved he's God. Surely now they believe and they understand what do they do? They start arguing about why God hasn't done something. And what does Jesus go? Oh, you unbelieving generation. 
Because he knows that it's like, it's not making any difference. Whatever happens, they still don't believe. Oh, it's the same, same inference. How long? You, you can get it even just reading this translation. How long will I, will I stay with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring him to me. Now, notice what Jesus does once again. Although he gives that, oh, he still tells them to bring the boy to him. Right? Because he sees there's a real need. You see, the Pharisees, when they were mourning and arguing, they, they, Jesus just walked away. But Jesus sees a boy in need. So he's still going to heal him, even though he's given his sigh. You see, what are they doing? They're arguing about why this boy wasn't healed. You know, a lot of Christians, they try and build a theology around why God, not, not, God is not doing something, instead of trying to see what God might be wanting to do. Don't ever build your belief in God based around what God hasn't done. Or you'll build up a whole system of religion that will be of no help to you whatsoever. Instead, come to Jesus. Bring the boy to me. Well, we don't need to because we've just had an argument and we've decided that it was not God's will to heal this boy or God would have healed him. So we don't need to come to Jesus because we've now got an argument in our head that explains why this situation's happened. Don't ever do that. Bring him to me. Stop arguing. Stop your rational theology that's trying to work out why God isn't doing what God wants to do and just come to Jesus. If you come to Jesus, he'll sort it out. When the Spirit saw Jesus, well, so they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. It's amazing that the, G the demon knew Jesus was there and the people didn't. The demon knew Jesus was God, and half the people there didn't know Jesus was God. They were just arguing about why God hadn't done what they wanted God to do. Do you know that's what we can do? We can forget what's happening in the spiritual realm and just argue about things in the natural realm. Don't do that. So Jesus sighed. Okay, let's go on to another one. John chapter 11. John chapter 11 and verse 33. It's a very well-known passage. This is where Jesus is coming to the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus' his friend has died. And what does Jesus do in this situation? Jesus is in the midst of grief. He's in the midst of mourning. He's in the midst of a, a whole family that's devastated through death. And, the, and they're, they're weeping there, and Jesus is coming to the tomb. When Jesus sees her weeping, and the Jews who have come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Let's go down. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. Now, again, you can get the inference there from the, from the English of what's happening, but actually... That word there, where it's saying Jesus is deeply moved, some translations say he was groaning within himself. It's that same word. It's that, oh. It, it, it's, it's, it's a pain Jesus is feeling that's so powerful that they actually describe it in, in, in quite a comprehensive way. He's deeply moved. He's groaning within himself. He's weeping, but he's not said anything. But he was saying more through that than through words. Do we understand how much God is deeply moved by our problems? Do we understand how much God's heart is affected when we're in pain? when we're in mourning, when we're in trouble. We have no idea. And we think, well, God's not saying anything. Jesus wasn't saying anything. But when they looked at him, they saw that there was more going on in the heart of Jesus than words could ever say. Even his enemies, remember the Jews there who turned up, they, the Pharisees, we've just seen them in, in, in a previous chapter. They were just questioning. They weren't even believing in Jesus. But even they said, see, look at that. What on earth is happening to him? He was distraught, 
but he wasn't saying anything. He was just saying, have you any idea how much God is involved in your pain? Do you know God feels your pain more than you do? And a parent knows what this is, because when your child's in pain, you feel the pain more than they do. Well, when you're God's children, don't you ever underestimate the pain God feels. God is sometimes in so much pain, he can't speak. He just releases that sigh. Here it's translated, or in the King James it's translated groaning. In this version it's translated he's being deeply moved. He's experiencing the pain and the fear and the mourning that all of them are going through. Where's God in this? God's suffering more than you are. God's suffering through what's happening in our society more than anybody else is. Because he actually sees everybody's pain. He's feeling it all. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who have opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? You see, they'd seen the previous miracles, but they didn't think God was going to do anything now. You know, Christians can have exactly the same attitude. You can think, well, I know God's done stuff in the past, but he's not doing anything at the minute. Oh, yes, he is. He's releasing his sigh. You know, God's sigh can heal. If we, if we know what's really happening. If we just think God's not saying anything, we've missed the point of the sigh, the deep sigh, the groan, the, the deep distress, the pain that's coming from God. If you can connect with that, that in itself will heal you. God's sigh is more powerful than any words you could ever speak. That's why Jesus could heal someone just by breathing on them. Jesus could give the Holy Spirit to someone just by breathing on them. He didn't need to speak. He was just releasing that which was in him. And there it is again in verse 38. Jesus once more deeply moved. He, for, the, for the gospel writer to write that down, what's happening? He's not said anything. He can't write down words. But he sees something happening in Jesus. Maybe it's, maybe it's a convulsion. Maybe it's a cry of pain. We, we don't know. But it's that thing once again, that sigh, that groaning, that inward momentum coming out of Jesus that's being released. Deeply moved, comes to the tomb. Gee, where's Jesus? He's there in the midst of death. He's there in the midst of the problem. He's there in the situation. Well, what's he saying? He's not saying anything. But he's saying everything. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Look at this, the next bit, the next three verses. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Next verse. So they took away the stone. Listen to this. Then Jesus looked up. Remember, when Jesus sighed, as we've already read, it says he looked up and sighed. Jesus is not a sigh of unbelief. It's a sigh of recognizing the situation and then looking to his father. He looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He hasn't said anything. We've just read, he hasn't said anything. So he thanks his father for hearing him, but he hasn't said anything. Oh, yes, he has. He's released the anguish of his heart. He's wept. He's released the sigh. He's been deeply moved. He's released the groan. Just because there's no words doesn't mean he hasn't said anything. The sigh of Jesus speaks more than any words. And he says, Father, you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. Jesus knew his Father in heaven had heard his sigh. Not his words because he hadn't said anything to heaven. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Why did Jesus say that? He said that so that everyone else would know that his sigh brings life to you. 
He said that so that everyone would know. He says, I'm not saying this. I know you've heard me, Lord. I know you've heard me, Father. But these people here, they don't think I've said anything. Actually, what I've done is I've actually requested that the life that you gave me, that I've now breathed out, is going to bring life into this situation. And I said that so they may believe, the people standing there. Have you heard the sigh of God? Do you know God's pain? Do you know he's groaning? Do you know he's deeply moved? Do you know he's releasing that sigh? Because he wants to give you life. That's what Jesus did in this situation. And those who knew him knew what was happening. And they believed and they obeyed him. You see, the Psalms are very clear. They say that God has listened to the words of my groaning. God has heard my anguish. Look at Psalm 38, verse 9. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. You know, sometimes all you can do is release a sigh to God and just say, Lord, thou knowest. You know, Lord. I can't put this into words, but you know what that means. The Psalms are very clear, and that's why sometimes it's translated meditate, because it's just an inward release of something. God hears our sighs. Look at Matthew 6 verse 20. Jesus taught this on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he, not, will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Now in that translation, they miss out the sigh. If you read the King James, it doesn't say, you have little faith. It says, oh. What's Jesus saying? You think God's not going to look after you? Oh. You have little faith. The oh is more powerful than the you have little faith. You see, Jesus tells us to believe in God like little children. Little children just assume their parents will look after them. They, just assume, they don't worry about it. They just assume they'll be clothed and fed. They just trust mum and dad will sort that out. But when we come to our heavenly father, we say, oh, oh, what if I run out? I can't serve you, Lord. What if I have no clothes? Do you know what God's answer is? Oh, you have little faith. Can't you hear the sigh you've just brought to God's heart by claiming God won't protect you, that God's not there to look after you, that'll make God sigh. God's very clear about that. But then if you look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2, now this is interesting because here it says, me, and it's the same word again, meanwhile we groan longing to be clothed inside with our uh, instead with a heavenly dwelling. You see, instead of creating a sigh to God's heart that God might not be there for us, you should be sighing because you want God's heaven to come. How many Christians actually release that sigh? We moan about our troubles here on earth, but are you moved inwardly of the fact that society is becoming more and more evil? Does that create a sigh within you? Because you want God's kingdom to come. You want righteousness to prevail. You want to be clothed, not with the things of this world. That just created a sigh to God's heart. No, the sigh within you is longing to be clothed with the things God wants for us. You know, in my life, more, many people are more concerned just about the temporal things rather than the heavenly things. Your sigh should be for the heavenly things, not the temporal things. They're, they're disappearing anyway. Our groan should be the same of Jesus for his kingdom to come, for his will to be done. And that's why when Jesus did come and, and, he, and people didn't listen, he would release that sigh. When he came to Jerusalem and wept over it, he didn't just say Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He went, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, if only you had known. If only you had understood who was actually here. I've longed to gather you, but you're not willing Oh, Jerusalem. Is God sighing? Yes, he is. Are we sighing? Hopefully over the right things. Not just sighing about things that we can't have when we can't have things. The Bible's very clear about this. Look at Romans 8 verse 23 and we'll draw this to a close. Romans 8 verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, Paul's writing to the 
the church at Rome, the Christians and believers at Rome, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, here it is again, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Let's go down a couple more verses because it mentions it again. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So two times there, this sigh, this groan, this inward release is mentioned. One is God sighing, the other is you sighing, but this time the sigh is in agreement. That's actually what God wants. He wants the inward release from us to be the same as the inward release from Him. Look at how it describes it there in verse 26. The Holy Spirit Himself intercedes, so the Holy Spirit prays through you. And what words does He use? He uses wordless groans, wordless sighs. That's actually what the Holy Spirit is doing through us. Now, he does give us words as well, but sometimes all he does is release the sigh through you. He releases his groan through you. He releases the very thing that happened to Jesus all the way through the Bible. You just release that. you know there's so much unbelief you know there's so much wickedness you know that people aren't receiving the salvation God has given to you you know there's so much so many problems and so much anxiety and mourning and stress and disaster and what do you do you come to God and God releases his groan through you and so you sigh not in desperation not in resignation not in defeat but in the reality that the Holy Spirit is bringing God's victory through you. Wordless groans. I don't know what to pray. You don't have to know what to pray. You just have to let the Holy Spirit flow through you. But I don't know what God's saying. You don't have to know what God's saying. You just have to experience his reality and let that reality, even if it's a wordless groan, let it flow through you. God is having his way. God's will is being done, just releasing the breath. Mark chapter 15, verse 37, then last scripture. Jesus on the cross, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. What did he say? Now, we know things he did say from the cross. We know he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You know, he said there's the seven statements from the cross that we might know very well. But what's that? With a loud cry, he just went, ah, let it all out. I'm sure you know that the Greek word and the Hebrew word, it's the same word for breath as it is spirit. So what Jesus did is he didn't just breathe out, he actually released his spirit. In fact, some translations say that he gave up his spirit. But he did it with a noise. How do you translate that? You can't. What Jesus did is he released all, that his, all the life that was in him, he released it out. And when he rose from the grave and met with the disciples, what was the first thing he did to them? It says he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. He was making them understand that that cry, that release, that sigh, that groan, that release of his spirit, he was now putting in them. You've got it now. Release it. Let it flow, flow through you. Don't you try and just deny it or ignore it or argue about it or say, why is God not doing this? Forget all that. Release the sigh of God that he's put within you by his Holy Spirit. 
That's why he died for us. Did he forgive us? Yes. Did he pray for us on the cross? Yes. Did he shed his blood for us on the cross? Of course he did. But he did more than that. He released his sigh into us. So in this time of trouble, and it's a big, you know, it's a very, very strange time that we're going through. Did God hear Jesus sigh on the cross? Oh, yes, he did. That's what saved us. That's what atoned for us. Obviously, along with his blood and his uh, sinless sacrifice, it was all one whole offering that he did. Did God hear him? Yes, he heard him. God the Father always heard Jesus when he sighed. And when we sigh and when we release the groan and when we release our breath by the Holy Spirit, God hears us as well. It's not the eloquency of our words. It's not our ability to articulate a, a, a prayer. It's the release of the life that God has put within us. Is that what we're doing? Let's not argue about it or look at what God isn't doing or ask why God's not doing that or discussing this or discussing that. That might just create the wrong kind of sight. Let's let the breath of God that he's put within us be released through us and we come to Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can flow through us so that God can be hearing what we're doing so that the prayers can be answered even if the prayers don't have words. We can do that right now. Let's bow our heads in the presence of God. Does God sigh? Yes, he does. Does he release that prayer that has no words? Yes, yes, Jesus did that all the time. But he releases his spirit into us. You know, during our lives, especially at times like this. We, we don't have the words. We can argue about whether we agree with the new rules and the new regulations and where we can and cannot go. We, we can discuss that till we're blue in the face. That's not going to solve anything. The only thing that's going to give us life is letting the Holy Spirit be released through us as we come to Jesus so that we long with inward groans to be clothed with what God has for us not moaning about what God hasn't done for us. God will always be there for us. So as we sit here right now, just release your inner longings out to the Lord. Not in unbelief, not in defeat or resignation, but just in the hope that we know Jesus has done everything. Let's look to the Lord right now. Father, thank you. You heard the sighs of your son, Jesus Christ. You heard that release that he gave on our behalf. And Father, thank you that now we now release by the spirit you gave us our trust, our hope, our longing for you, for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done, so that we will be clothed with all that you have for us in heaven and that your will shall be established in our lives. Lord, forgive us for arguing and debating every issue. Forgive us for the contention and uh, the negativity and unbelief that sometimes we get involved in. Forgive us these things, Father. And now, Lord, we place our hope in you, our faith in you as we come to you. Lord, release your life through us, even when we have no words. Let, you, let the sigh that you put in Jesus flow through us so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.